Uh, and I want to thank so much our co-sponsors, the NU Bookstore. The NU Bookstore has really been there for us since the inception of the Meet the Authors series and really helps to cover our program expenses. I also want to thank the wonderful Libraries Programming and Communications Committee members. All of you do such a great job putting together a real robust uh, season and I think we've had about 20 programs scheduled for this fall so thank you so much for that. Our Meet the Author series explores the important issues of today and brings together the campus community to discuss and debate these issues. Today we have a chance to explore a personal narrative of our guest speaker and uh, so we're so happy that John could be here. Um, John Elder Robeson, for the past 20 years, he has run an independent automobile repair business, and uh, his company is known nationwide for its restoration and customization of work, and John proudly identifies himself as a machine aficionado, which I love. He and his wife live next door to Augustine Burroughs, his brother, in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. John is going to talk about his personal story, Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Asperger's. Thank you so much for being here, John. Oh, and I forgot to mention, please help to support our program by becoming a library supporter. Thank you. She already went through the can you hear me routine. You can all hear me, right? Yeah. I'm considerably larger and louder. I, I figured that that would be OK. Well, thank you all for coming out to see me. You know, looks like we have some, maybe some Aspergians in the audience and some literature enthusiasts and maybe some machine aficionados and maybe some music lovers. Do we have Kiss and Pink Floyd fans and stuff among you today, a few of you? And um, do we have Mercedes Benz and Land Rover enthusiasts, a few of them even? You're not as quick to raise your hands. <laughs> You're probably... Well, many of you, I guess, are, are younger, and they're still symbols of evil capitalism. But when you're, you're older, you, you might feel differently about them. I don't know. But I got my first experience, actually, with those kinds of cars. And I was in the music business. You know, I was 19 years old. And we had Cadillac limousines and Lincoln limousines. And then we had uh, Mercedes-Benz cars to destroy on our music tours. That's how I started out with it. So do... Um, have many of you read Look Me in the Eye? Some of you have. That was a decent number. Well, for those of you who haven't read the book, Look Me in the Eye is my story of what it's like to grow up as kind of a misfit kid and learn to fit in. Now, as it happens, I have this condition, Asperger's Syndrome, which is a high-functioning form of autism. It caused me to say and do strange things when I was a kid. It still causes me to sometimes stay and do strange things as a grown-up. That made it difficult for me to make friends and engage other children in the, the usual way. When I was little, society didn't really have all of these sophisticated diagnoses that most of you have grown up with. You know, we didn't have special ed programs in schools. Um, all these different names they give to differences for kids it really didn't exist. You know, you were either a regular kid or you were retarded and put in a state school, which was a very undesirable outcome. And all of us marginal children, you know, we very much wanted to avoid that or else you had some obvious physical disability. And that was pretty much it. So there were many, many children that would be in special needs or special ed classes today who when I was a kid you know we just were kind of all thrown in with the general population of kids and we struggled to make our way as best we could. Look Me in the Eye is not a story of growing up with knowledge of Asperger's because nobody knew about it. You know it's just a story of how I learned to fit in and because I was different I couldn't really make friends or do the normal things. Um, not only was I different I was resistant to authority and I would not do what the teachers told me. I wouldn't do what, I wouldn't really do what anyone told me. I didn't do what the police told me or my parents or anyone else either. And as you can imagine that, that led to difficulties and um, 
I was determined to, you know, break free of it all. I got myself a motorcycle, and one day I rode my motorcycle to school, and I rode it down the corridor, and I parked it in the center courtyard, just like the other kids did with their bicycles, and that just put them over the edge. And they had already been threatening me with the army and with jail and stuff like that. None of that had any effect on me. But finally, the school and I parted ways permanently. And um, those of us who grow up with some kind of difference, when we're young, all we see are the disability components of our condition. And I'm sure that a number of you in the audience today have grown up with some kind of difference of your own. And, you know, when you're a young person, you think, oh, you know, I'm never going to have a girlfriend, I'm never going to have a boyfriend, nobody's going to like me, I'm not going to have any, you know, I'm not going to have any friends, and life's just going to suck. But as you get older, the differences that cause people to laugh at you and ridicule you as a geek and, and all the other stuff that they would say to me, at least when I was little, those differences turn into, at least for a good number of us, gifts that allow us to find our place in the world. So when I was six and seven and eight years old, you know, I loved puzzles and things like that that people sort of made fun of. But when I was a teenager, I found that I could see into musical systems. I could see into amplifiers and how they worked. I could see the flow of signals through them. And I kind of took it for granted that everybody else could do that too, because you know when you're a kid, you assume that whatever you can do, grown-ups can do better, right? Because you're a small version of them. It never really occurred to me that the ability to see into things like that was extraordinary. How would I know? But what I did see was that I could seize upon these things that I could do, and I could go from being ridiculed to actually being accepted by some people. Now, the people that accepted me in the beginning were musicians, and they were, you know, bigger freaks than me. But it was okay, because we were like all freaks together, and, and it, was, it was a good thing. So when I left high school, I hesitate to say that I got tossed out. It didn't exactly toss me out. I sort of didn't exactly drop out. It was kind of a mutual, a mutual decision to be done with me. Um, I joined this local band, FAT. Now, that was a wonderful thing for me because I lived in a, a big old house in Ashfield out in the Berkshires, you know, with all the guys in the band. And for the first time, I was part of a community. I had a job. I made 80 bucks a week, parked my motorcycle outside the window, you know, and I would carry the sound equipment to the different gigs, and we'd set it up, and we'd run it. And, you know, of course, I'd, I'd fix it, and I'd build it. We actually played out in Boston. This, that was what brought me for my very first times to this city. We used to play at Bunratty's here, and we played uh, at the Orpheum Theater, which I think now has been, both those places have been torn down. But the Orpheum Theater is still there. It is? It's still here? Now, d where was Bunratty's? It was, it's, is it, it's not here anymore, is it? Does anyone know where that was? No? Well, Bunratty's, that was a rough place. It was a biker bar. They used to have disciples in that place. And um, anyway, I started out fixing electronic systems, but pretty soon I was building them. And other bands kind of saw that I could do that, and they wanted me to join in with them. And uh, I began working for bigger and bigger bands. I got hired by Pink Floyd's sound company in the late 1970s, and I became the engineer for all of their stuff in the United States. Now, what a sound company does is they provide the sound systems that a band needs to play in a civic center or like a, you know, a college auditorium, any of these big venues, because the bands only own the stage amplifiers. So anyway, being part of the sound company, I put together systems for many, many different bands. And that, in turn, led me to get hooked up with KISS. One day, they were in our studios in New York, and I came in, and I saw Ace Freely digging at the front of a guitar with a chisel. And I asked him what he was doing, and he said he wanted to make it blow fire. <laughs> and, you know, at the time, I still didn't, like, have a girlfriend. I still didn't have any, like, normal friends, but I was very confident of my technical abilities. And I said, I can do that. 
<laughs> and I talked to him for a couple of minutes, and before I knew it, he turns to his roadie and he says, Tex, have Gibson send this guy a Les Paul right away. And um, so I took it home, and my friend Bouton and I, and um, this girl, little bear, who actually became my first wife that you'll meet in the book, we uh, hollowed out the back of the guitar, and we put this stainless steel box in it, and we lined it with asbestos so it wouldn't burn the guitar up. We took the pickup out of the front, and we made a trap door where the pickup used to be, so it looked like a pickup, but when you turned one of the volume knobs, it snapped open, and two smoke bombs went off, and some quite powerful lights started burning. And the first time they played that thing in a Civic Center, you know, the guitar switched on, and you could see it threw light all the way to the back of the hall, and the crowd just roared. And it was probably the proudest moment of my life that I had made something like that that people appreciated. And it burned so hot, it would burn the top couple strings off the guitar. Anyway, after that, I was kind of off and running, and I made all the guitars that they played that shot rockets and shot flames and lit up and blew up and all the stuff like that. You can see them all on the Internet now, thanks to YouTube. <laughs> and um, after that, I, um, I decided I needed a legitimate job. But, of course, I was not like a fully legitimate guy at that point. So I looked around for where I might obtain work, and luckily I saw that Milton Bradley was looking for engineers to design electronic toys, and I thought, well, that's sort of a close thing for the music business. They wanted to design sound effects for new toys, and they wanted to, to make what were then some of the first toys and games that would speak and recognize speech. So it was pretty easy to find engineers in those days with all sorts of standard experience, like designing process control machinery or computers or any kind of stuff like that. But I was like the only guy that came in the door that knew about designing sound effects, and they hired me. And it turned out that uh, actually the engineers there, they are as big a bunch of freaks as the musicians. Now, of course, I know about that. Now that I know about this Asperger's thing, I realize that many engineers everywhere are Aspergians like me, and to the extent that I believe myself to be a freak, they are in the same boat with me. And I'm sure there are others of you in the crowd, and you probably see that too. So anyway, I did well at that because it, once again, was a place I could use my creative skills. Unfortunately, I did well enough at it that I got promoted and I found myself in management. <laughs> and, and of course now, it wasn't like creating new sound effects, it was all about doing budgets and employee reviews and marketing presentations, and I was a complete failure at that. And I realized I was not making it at that and I needed to find something else to do. So I gave a lot of thought to what I could do that I couldn't get fired from. And I decided that I had always had this love of machinery. You know, I'd loved electronics and, and machines. I liked cars, but I also liked tractors and farm machinery and stuff because my grandfather had a farm in Georgia. So I decided I'd start me a business fixing cars. And I gave thought to what kind of cars I would fix, and I thought I'd probably fix good cars because the people who had them were more likely to care about them I sort of figured, well, somebody with a, you know, a Chrysler minivan could care less about it, but somebody with a, a Porsche or a Jaguar or a Land Rover would be really into it, you know, and they could appreciate somebody like me that also cared about machinery. And it proved to be kind of a field of dream story, because I started this company not out here in Boston, where you actually have nice cars on the streets, but in Springfield, which is kind of a an industrial wasteland in western Massachusetts and you know just like the Field of Dreams story I went around and I told people that oh, I'm the best guy to fix a Rolls Royce in all of New England and you know there was a thriving Rolls Royce dealer out here at Foreign Motors West and you know Foreign Motors West is a great big place it's now Herb Chambers so these customers would come out to me from Boston and I had this garage that wasn't even the size of one area of seats here where you are and my house was smaller than this room, you know. And so these cars were worth more than the whole thing. But somehow, through force of will, I convinced people to leave these cars with me. And, 
And you know, I actually, I guess I had a skill like seeing into music that other people didn't have. Because despite the beautiful facilities in the big cities and all of these, these big dealerships, somehow we succeeded in building a bigger and bigger and bigger following. And today, we receive custom work, especially on Rolls Royce and Land Rover and Mercedes from really all over the United States. You know, there's cars in our shop now from Florida, from Texas, from Chicago, they're just from all over. It's kind of a remarkable story. Well, one day, one of our customers who I'd become friendly with came in and he had this book with him and he said, you know, he's a therapist too, I didn't tell you that part, but he, he said, you know, therapists like me learn not to diagnose our friends or we won't have any friends, but I got this book that describes you to a T. Now, at that time, you know, I had a seemingly successful business and I had, you know, a wife and a small kid and stuff and I was going along okay. I had started out as a, as a misfit and a friendless kid, but I made an okay life. So I look at this book, it's called Asperger's Syndrome, and I said, what's this? And he says, uh, it's a form of autism. I said, what are you, nuts? You know, to me, the only thing I knew about autism was like the kid, Tommy on St. Elsewhere back in the 1980s TV show. I thought, you know, kids with autism, you know, were in these state schools. They didn't talk. They didn't do anything. And he says, no, look in the book. It's, it's, this is you. He's opened it up. And I looked in it, and it was the most remarkable thing. It was as if there was like, like a list of things people with Asperger's do that other people don't do. And over here, you have a list of things people with Asperger's don't do or don't see that everyone else expects. And I read down it. He was right. It was me. It was the most amazing thing. I decided at first that I was going to change my own life. I said, okay, if I can identify these things that I do and things I don't do, I'll teach myself to behave differently. I will make myself pass for normal. And you know, you can kind of see it. I sort of succeeded at that. It, it really worked. Well, my brother, at about the same time, took up book writing. He wrote this book, Running with Scissors, about our childhood. And you know, I put the book out. He wrote this first book about the depravity of the home shopping network. Kind of a harmless, <laughs> harmless piece of fiction. So I put that book on the counter at our automobile company. Then Running with Scissors comes, this story of our horrible childhood and stuff. And I put it out there for sale, you know, because I was a loyal brother. But I thought, you know, people are going to come in, and they're going to buy this thing, and they're going to see what we're really like, and they're never even going to speak to me again. <laughs> but to my great surprise, that didn't happen. People actually read the book, and they came back and they said, you know, I can't believe you grew up like that, and this happened to me when I was a kid, and that happened to me, and people began telling me their own stories. It was actually amazing seeing the acceptance from people of, of us in that story. It was just totally opposite what I had expected. I guess people tell me it's like, you know, if you're an alcoholic and you go to an AA meeting or something, it's like what you see there. Um, it's really, uh, it was really remarkable. So I decided that although it wasn't a disease or an addiction or anything, it was a major life-changing event, learning about Asperger's, and I thought I would try and tell my story to the world. And that was the genesis of Look Me in the Eye. Now, I can answer questions. Do you folks want me to read you anything out of the book? Some of you do? Well. Well, let me offer you a choice. Would you like to hear, let's see, would you like to hear about garbage? <laughs> that's, that's, I've opened it right to garbage here. We have, we have a story. This is called Collecting the Trash and uh, begins on page 95. I'll have to start in the middle here. Now, my parents were both college professors. My father was the head of philosophy department at the University of Massachusetts and my mother taught English and writing. And This is a story about 
a faculty party, which I'm sure being associated with the university, at least a good many of you have some experience with. This is my parents' friend, Walter, who was 40 years old. Walter had had cards printed for his party. He gave me one when we arrived. It said, Walter Henderson, 40, lecturer, 40 different topics, traveler, 40 different countries, chef, 40 different courses, lover, 40 different women. This was going to be my kind of party, I could already tell. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there. Walter's wife, Annette, saw me and led me over to talk to some of her friends. I guess she meant well. After a brief introduction, she flitted off to take care of the next guest, and her friend George, who she had left me with, turned out to be a rather pompous professor who tried to engage me in conversation. We have a son about your age, he told me. We're very proud of him. He's starting at Harvard in the fall. Just then, another couple walked over and said, our daughter Janet has decided to go to Smith, so she'll be close to home for four more years. What are you doing? All of them looked at me. I wasn't doing anything in particular. I certainly wasn't going to Harvard. Somehow I was in the improbable position of scoring in the 99th percentile on the intelligence tests and still flunking high school. I was sure that this crowd would just sneer at the idea of my growing reputation in the local music scene, so I decided not to mention it. I had a flash of inspiration. I've actually started on a career, I said. Really? What are you doing? This came from Thurston, another pompous friend of Annette's. Thurston, a department head at Amherst College, was far removed from making any career choices of his own. He stood there, drink in hand, with a superior smile, thinking of his son, Thugwald, or whatever his name was, down at Yale. <laughs> I've gotten into the waste management business down in Springfield. They've started me right in the bottom so I can learn the trade on a truck in the North End. <laughs> you mean you're a garbage collector? Someone asked, polite but incredulous. Garbage collectors were not usually seen at Amherst College faculty parties. Garbage collectors came in afterwards and emptied the trash. They did not participate in creating the trash with their intellectual betters. I smiled back. We don't call ourselves garbage collectors. We are sanitary engineers. By this time, another older fellow had stepped over to join the conversation. I didn't know him, but with his curly hair, tweed coat, and bow tie, I doubted if he was a sanitary engineer. <laughs> I'm an engineer. I went to college for eight years for the privilege, and I don't think a mere city garbage collector has the credentials to call himself an engineer. I decided to change the subject. You know, we see all kinds of stuff at work. Just last week, one of my buddies found a dead baby in the dumpster behind one of the dorms at Springfield College. That was met with shocked silence. <laughs> They say the mother was a student there. No one knows why she threw the baby away. Her father was a president of some big company, but she's in jail now. <laughs> there were six people gathered around. I had given them something to think about. Would their kids do that at college? <laughs> one of the moms forced a smile and said, it must be hard being out there in all kinds of weather. The weather isn't the problem. We can take weather. It's the packs of wild dogs and the feral children you really have to worry about. Feral children? That surprised them. We meet them in the rougher parts of town. Two of them hit one of our guys in the head with a bottle full of gravel. Cut him up bad, almost killed him. They're the worst when they're in packs and some of them have knives. My audience looks shocked. Can you get a police escort, one said? No. The police don't care. They have their own problems. It's a city, you know. But we started carrying billy clubs. They won't let us carry guns. A few of the guys carry motorcycle chains. We wear them like necklaces. A punk with a knife is no match for one of us swinging a motorcycle chain. I let them digest that for a moment. They would see their local trash man in a whole new light now. They looked horrified, but they couldn't help themselves. I was not your usual faculty party entertainment. What do your parents think of your new career, Juan asked. They wanted me to go to medical school, but when I told them how much money my boss makes, they were impressed. He does a lot better than any doctor I know, so I guess they're proud of me. How does your boss do so well? 
asked a bookish looking fellow who had recently walked up. Tips. We get tips everywhere we go. I've never heard of that. Who gives a garbage man tips? I've never done that. The woman who was speaking sounded pretty sure of herself. No tips for her garbage man. Well, if you're in the city and you don't want the dumpster to spill shit all over your steps when they pick it up, you tip the trash man. One of those dumpsters can do a lot of damage if it falls in your car. What if it falls on your cat or your dog? A well-tipped driver makes sure that doesn't happen. And if you've got a restaurant, you tip really good. Otherwise, your trash overflows, you get rats, and the health inspector shuts you down. Inspired by their silence, I continued. Did you hear about that burger joint on Boston Road? Whole kitchen was full of rats, and a little girl went in the bathroom and got bit. It was something savage. Your arms were all chewed up. And just nine years old, that place won't ever reopen. And you know why? They didn't pay their sanitary engineer. <laughs> Excuse me, can I talk to you a second, said Annette. She and my mother had caught me entertaining her friends. <laughs> they steered me away from the group, and I moved towards the food table where I picked up the shrimp platter, which only had 11 shrimp remaining, and ate them. I was having a fine time. John Elder, what are you going to do? You can't lead those people on like that. They believe you. Well, you invited me, and they had, but they wouldn't do so again. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll take care of it. I'll apologize. I walked back to the group of garbage aficionados that I had collected. <laughs> Folks, I'm sorry, but I've got to go. They just called from work. We have an emergency. One of the other garbage companies firebombed one of our trucks, and they're calling us all in. I'll see you later. And with that, I walked to my motorcycle, put on my helmet and jacket, and kicked over the engine. The back wheels spun up little clumps of grass as I rode away with my crazy parents and their friends receding in the rearview mirror. So as you can see, I might not have known how to make friends, but at least I had learned how to become somewhat entertaining. And I guess the, the message of that was, you know, that if I, couldn't, uh, if I couldn't make friends in the normal way, I could at least be different. And that's always proven to work for me. Well, now that you've sort of heard the story and you've seen a sample of the book, who has questions about the book or Asperger's or anything else at all? Oh, yes, we're going to. We'll okay. I'll repeat all the questions. So we're going to do professional questions and answers. <laughs> Who's going to be first? We've scared them all. OK, you're first. Um, you had mentioned um, in the book, uh, one of the books you had read, and had uh, listed um, people with Asperger's did these things, but didn't know how to do these things. You had mentioned these yep. charts. Well, he asked what those differences are with Asperger's. First of all, the book that I made reference to is something that any of you with a personal connection to Asperger's should know about. It's called Asperger's Syndrome by Tony Atwood, who's an Australian psychologist. Um, it should be available at uh, you know most any bookstore that would have my own book. Um, as to what exactly the differences are with Asperger's, um, I'll give you a five minute or two minute or whatever it is explanation of the theory of Asperger's. All of us have a number of different kinds of intelligence. The most obvious intelligence is your um, logical brain. It's your ability to uh, solve A plus B is C or mathematical problems. It's your, your conventional reasoning power. There's a part of your brain that processes and then interprets visual information like you have in books as a part of your brain that matches up patterns and allows you to recognize dogs or horses or identify a Picasso or Monet painting. There is a part of some of our brains, well all of us have this part of the brain, it just works better than others. There's, there's a part of our brains that controls our bodies. So when you look at the guys that say are the superstars of your basketball team or your swim team or your hockey team, um, you might think all oh, those guys are like just jocks, but when you think that, it's kind of an oxymoron because they aren't 
just superstars of those teams because of these great bodies. They are superstars because that part of their brain is a genius in its own way in telling them how to move their arms and legs. If you took a guy like Larry Bird and you put his brain in my body or your body, that's what would make the great player, not putting your brain into Larry Bird's body. So anyway, you've got all these different kinds of intelligence within the brain. Autism is a condition where there is a substantial imbalance in the distribution of those intelligences, and some of those intelligences are imbalanced to such a degree that they don't work always on a freestanding level, and they don't work together very well. People with Asperger's are people with a higher functioning version of autism. That means that perhaps the average intelligence is a little higher level. Um, and also, we tend to have a deficiency in emotional intelligence. That's the part of our brains that allows us to look at you and say, she really likes me and she's really mad at me, and, and sort of divine what people are thinking and feeling. It's, it's the part of the brain that if I drop something on the floor and you say, that's really great, it says, he's pissed, not, I better break another one. Because, you know, I did stuff like that as a child, and it's funny now, but when you're a kid, you just cry because you can never say the right thing. That's what a weakness in emotional intelligence means. So people with Asperger's have this imbalance in our intelligence. We have a weakness in emotional intelligence, and many of us have a corresponding strength in logical intelligence. The strength in logical intelligence means that we are sort of natural born geeks, and many of us do really well as experts on insects or paintings or software engineering or electronics like I did. That's what helped me be a success, you know, learning what these skills were. That, I guess, in a nutshell, is, is what Asperger's is. So, let's see, who's next? Yes? Could you briefly describe that once you found this book, you had sort of a re-education process for yourself? Now, can you describe that a little bit, say what was easy, what was difficult? Well, first of all, it wasn't so much a re-education process as an education process. The significance of that is, look at the title of my book, look me in the eye, right? If you grew up with Asperger's, you grew up with people saying, look at me, young man, look at me when I talk to you. And, and if you're like me, you'd look up at them, you'd look back down, because it made you uncomfortable. So you'd look up, you'd look back down, and you would think, I am looking at you, what's the matter with you? You would never really understand what simple phrases like that mean. You go through life and people, people say, why don't you ever get what I'm saying? Why don't you ever laugh at this? Why don't you ever do this? Why don't you ever do that? And, and all the times you hear those things, I don't know why. I think I do it. I thought I was paying attention to you. I thought I was listening. I thought I gave a nice response when I dropped that and broke it or when I did this or when I did that. So what learning about Asperger's did was it suddenly showed me what they were expecting me to do, and I could say, now I see why what I did was strange. Because for the first time, I understood what people meant by phrases like, look me in the eye. And I understood, I understood that not everyone was like me. That was the first time I really knew that. You know, you always assume everyone has the same abilities as you. And, and when it comes to something basic, like looking somebody in the eye or looking at you and seeing if you're happy or you're sad, I assumed that my ability to do that was basically like everyone else in the world. And, and what were they telling me that I wasn't already doing? So that was, so when you, then you think, well, what was hard about that? The whole thing was hard. It's an ongoing process. You know, I, I guess a better way to answer it would be what made it easier. Because my life until age 40 was a constant, you know, struggle with being a, a misfit. And I think that once I learned about Asperger's, I ceased to really feel like a total misfit in a bad way. I felt like all of a sudden 
I'm normal for what I am. I may be different from 99% of other people, but I'm part of a group and they're like me. And, and that is a very empowering thing. And the more knowledge you have about how you're different, the more power you have to make your life better. So the more I learn, the better I say life got for me in that regard. And um, I'm going to write a second book, which is tentatively called Beyond Normal, that will describe in more detail how I taught myself to do things, to give folks like you that ask that question more insight and illustrate it still with these stupid stories of life like collecting the trash. So you can look for that next year for a 300-page version of the answer. <laughs> <coughs> yes? Um, there are a number of things that I struggle with with Asperger's. You uh, asked about the, uh, the wife business. There are two chapters in the book on wife acquisition and wife management. Um, and uh, So you can read some of my uh, current thoughts on that. Um, there, the biggest thing that I struggle with, I guess, is still the recognition that uh, I just don't have many of the same responses. Everyone will laugh at a joke except me. That's not funny to me. And, uh, or everyone will, everyone will look or act a certain way, and I don't really do that. So sometimes you still feel kind of isolated or alone, no matter how good you get at that among people who are different from you. But just knowing I'm part of a community is a tremendous improvement for those of you who, um, you know, have um, connect personal connections to Asperger's and autism here in Boston. Do all of you know about the Asperger Association of New England? Yeah, you do, yeah. And um, the Asperger Association of New England is online at www.aane.org. Luckily for everyone here, they are one of the most active Asperger support organizations in the United States. It's like right here in Boston. So they have like support groups and you can go and you can go and like talk about all kinds of different stuff, you know, and it's really good. So anyway, that helps me with what I still struggle with and I, it, it definitely is, is a st still a struggle. It's always hard to be different. I always envied you know, the pretty girls that were cheerleaders and all the guys would come up and ask them to dance and stuff like that. And the handsome guys that were like the captains of the swim team and all. But you know, now I go to these events and I talk to people and I see these pretty girls and handsome guys and they're like 35 and 40 years old. And it's obvious that they were pretty girls and handsome guys and they were 17. And, and yet they tell me of these terrible struggles just like my own. And I realized that being a pretty girl or a handsome guy is really not a defense against feeling like a misfit. Maybe if we lined us up, maybe nine people would choose me as a misfit and maybe only three people would choose you, but it doesn't change the fact that you and I both felt the same way. And that too was kind of an amazing discovery for me. And, and really all the struggles you see and look me in the eye are kind of a microcosm of the human condition. They're not really unique to, to me. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. I actually have Asperger's syndrome myself, and a lot of people say that I use it as a crutch, that like because I have it, like I can't do this or that. Um, that's one of my concerns with, um, with people that are your age. My son is 18, and he has Asperger's too. The thing is, when you're 12 years old, and I see this now in schools, um, when you're 12 years old in a, a special ed class in Newton, you can get up and you can throw your food at the other kid and the teacher will just say to the other teacher, just ignore him, he has Asperger's, and just ignore him and he'll stop doing it. You know, and I think to myself, this is nuts. You know, when I was at 12 years old and I was in school, you got sent to the principal's office and you got suspended and you probably got paddled 
by some large teacher with a ruler. And, and the thing is, you know, I told you that we didn't have Asperger's. We had kids who were retarded and kids who were regular. Well, if you did stuff like that, you got sent to some place like the state school for retarded kids. And it was like a death sentence. You, some kids never came out of that. It was the last thing in the world you wanted. And as a result, when I was young, I learned not to behave that way. And that is, in a nutshell, I think, the reason you don't see a lot of disabled people who are 50 years old with Asperger's. Because even though we may have significant impairments, we learned to make our way. If you say to yourself ever, as a young person with Asperger's, if you say, well, I can't do this because I have Asperger's, or oh, I'm just, you know, I have Asperger's, I'm not going to do this or that, you set yourself up for a failure. Because Asperger's is an invisible disability. You know, if you're in a wheelchair, you got some big brace on your leg or something, people accommodate you. You know, nobody, nobody says, come on, get moving, to the guy who's slow in the intersection in a wheelchair. But if you've got Asperger's and you're just kind of bobbing and weaving and you're standing in the middle of the street, you're just some dumb jerk who's holding up traffic. Now, you may have just as legitimate a neurological reason for bobbing and weaving in the street as the guy has for being in a wheelchair, but society won't recognize that. And the worst part of it is because many of us have a strong logical brain, we'll say and do something totally stupid, and, and somebody will say, well, what is the matter with you? you? You're so smart. You talk so well. You're so good at math. I can't believe you would do such a stupid thing. And then they assume there's just something wrong with you. And, and you can't let that happen. You know, you've, you've got to recognize that we aren't people in wheelchairs. We, there is no handicapped parking space for Asperger's. You know, you've got to, you've got to make a good life with what you and I are. That's kind of what it is. And you know, when I see people, I just wish that you could have seen me 30 years ago because I can see so much of myself in people like you. And, and I know how far I've come in my own life with that. You know, if you go on my website, look at the pictures of me as a lost two-year-old and five-year-old. Go on YouTube and look at videos of Temple Grandin. She's 10 years older than me. Right now, she and I sound the same. We could be sisters and brothers. Look at her 25, 30 years ago in videos. And, and it's just such a dramatic improvement with age in people like us. So that is a great thing. Anyway, um, yes? How would, you, how would you help a kid with Asperger's? I've got a six-year-old that has been diagnosed with Asperger's, and I'm trying to help him find his way. Well, one really important thing about how you would help a kid with Asperger's find his way, with my own six-year-old Aspergian, um, I paid really close attention to the times he would screw up playing with other kids. When you read my book, you're going to read stories about how I struggled and failed playing with kids on the playground at your own son's age. So I would observe my kid having failures like that and I would explain to him what was going wrong. And I did it time and time again and I believe that eventually it stuck because by the time he was 18 he had more friends than I ever had at that age. The other thing that I would say to you is if your kid is like many kids with Asperger's, he's going to develop all these special interests, whether they're batteries or computers or whatever. Um, and you may get sick of them and bored of them, and you may, you know, other kids may laugh at him and stuff. Just remember that, you know, if your kid really loves batteries when he's 12 years old, all the girls are going to laugh at him because he's a geek that loves batteries. But when he invents the battery cells that make Priuses go 300 miles between recharges, he'll make ten million dollars and those girls will line up wanting to marry him. <laughs> and um, so it, it is really true that the very attributes that make us seem like dis disabled freaks at that age make us seem like geniuses at age 30. And I would just keep those things in mind and you should join the AANE and go to the parents meetings because there are parents support groups around you here. 
Yes, in the back there. Relationships, whether one should um, do anything different than an ordinary person would do if one has Asperger's. Do you have any thoughts on that? Are you asking uh, whether you should do something different to start a relationship or maintain one? Both. Also, I was curious as to whether the, in other words, I've not been involved in the um, uh, AANE or the other support organizations, but I wonder to what degree they're helpful in. in this respect and also in terms of like, in other words, should a, somebody with Asperger's seek another Aspie or they, should they not? Or, you know, just curious about your thoughts on that. Okay, well, let's see. To answer those questions in order, first of all, <laughs> you said that you have not been involved with the AANE and that is unfortunate for you because if you had been, you could have attended our two-hour workshop on relationships and dating at the AAE convention a month and a half ago. And now that you know that, sign up and go to the next one. Um, then, um, what kind of person should a guy with Asperger's seek out? Should it be another person with Asperger's? Okay. Um, my first wife was like me. We were both, you know, geeks. And we met in geeky places, right? I mean, you, if you're a guy with Asperger's and you're 18 years old, you hang out in the science fiction society or the math club or the chess club, and everyone who hangs out in those places is a geek. Many of them have Asperger's. Um, and, and of course, if that is the only place you go, that's like the only possible supply of girls, right? If there's one in there, you try and go for it, you know? Um, the, um, the trouble with that philosophy and this is a general piece of advice, not advice about a specific girl in a specific club, but, but generally speaking, people with Asperger's have a blindness to the unspoken communications of other people. We are very weak in that regard. So if you seek out a female who is similarly weak in that regard, what do you have? Both of you are blind to each other's emotions, and both of you are pretty smart logically. So both of you are gifted in one way and crippled in, an, in the same way. You can't really support yourself. You can't support each other naturally with that. I think that is one reason that my first marriage failed. My second wife is the opposite. She has a really strong emotional intelligence. So with her strong emotional intelligence and my strong logical intelligence taken together, we are a stronger than average package whereas two people with Asperger's may still be an imbalanced package. And it's not to say that it can't work, because there's plenty of guys with Aspergian you know, mates where it does work, but I think that logic would tell you that finding someone that compliments you, you know, even though that's harder to do because you aren't going to find them in the math club, um, I, I think that's a, a good strategy. And um, there are workshops on relationships and dating that the AANE and also GRASP run throughout the year, and I would encourage you to participate in those because it's a longer answer that I can give here. But there's a bunch of people that will come and talk at those things, and they're all people like us that can do so from personal experience. So, yes. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think that there is significant evidence that um, through the process of brain plasticity that I have kind of rewired my brain and I have markedly increased my emotional intelligence over the last little while. I have participated in some experimental research that's uh, operated by Harvard Medical School's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. It's called TMS, where they're using high-powered magnetic fields to induce electrical currents in the brain and, and alter the way we think. 
you can read about that on my blog. Um, I think between that and the constant feedback that I get from being a fairly public figure, um, it has significantly increased that ability in me. Um, so yes, I, I am different. One thing that is obviously different as a result of TMS is that I am able to like look you in the eye and engage you in a fundamentally different way than I ever could before. And, and if you had, say, a brother with Asperger's, you might say, well, you just look right at me and my brother always looks down. And something that's really fascinating, and you can see this, go to my blog and look for a post back in June called The Challenge and Opportunity of Autism. That's a collection of video clips shot by the news media. There's a bunch of clips that were shot before I did a particular TMS stimulation, and then there's one that's shot after. And it is a striking difference. That one, that one session just changed me in that way. And afterwards, I look at people and engage them in a way I never could before. And it's almost magical. And um, any of you who have this personal connection to Asperger's who would like to participate in cutting edge research on that, you should go to my blog, which is, you can just type John Robeson blog into Google. It's jerobeson.blogspot.com. You can scroll down to the, I think the last post in October, the first post in November, and there's a little summary of what we've done in the TMS lab this summer. And the email addresses for two of the research scientists are there, and I would welcome any of you to come over to Beth Israel over on Brookline Avenue and see what we're doing in the labs and think about joining the studies yourselves. It's, it's powerful, powerful stuff. And we're going to have research studies continuing next year. Also, on the topic of that, since you asked me, um, we will be on uh, Fox News. Um, Alvaro Pascal Leone, the chief of the neuroscience group there, myself and some of the other scientists, will be on Fox uh, probably next week or the week after. And um, so you can, if you go to my blog, you can watch for that. I'll announce when it'll be on and you'll be able to see it. Yes, you have a question back there? Oh, uh, wait a minute. I didn't hear that. How do you feel about tuning children with um, Asperger's with medicine um, um, also with different brain alternative technologies? Well, first of all, TMS is, um, is research science. It's not a, a treatment, so it's not like on the table for children at this moment. I, I guess I think, though, that conceptually, I feel like Everyone who's my age grew up without medication unless we had an obvious disability. For example, if I had Asperger's and I had epilepsy and I fell to the floor in a seizure, I'm sure that it would be right to give me medicine if I was a kid to stop my seizures. But do I agree with giving kids Ritalin and antidepressants and all this other stuff we medicate our kids with today? I mean, you have to look at that and you have to look at your parents and your grandparents and you have to ask yourself is my generation, those of us that are 15 to 25 years old, are we better off as a result of all of these drugs than our parents and our grandparents? I'm not so sure you are. And um, so I think that my skepticism about medication does not apply to Asperger's. I have a skepticism because I think that we are tending to medicate our kids into submission rather than solving our problems. You know, we have situations in schools where kids are bullied and teased mercilessly. And some of those kids have Asperger's and some of them just have red hair and some of them are just whatever they are. They get bullied and they get teased and they become miserable and they become sad. And what do we do about that? We put the kid on antidepressants. But the kid wasn't depressed, the kid was bullied and sad. If we can correct the problems that made the kid sad, we wouldn't need to medicate the kid. The thing is, it's harder to do that. It's very easy to give people pills. And, and I think as a society, we have gone in the direction of doing too much of that. But having said that, I, I certainly don't want to make you think that I'm opposed to medicine when there's an obvious need for it. So. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. Even looked as far as, see, this is an Asperger thing. I even look over here, you know. But. Um, how was it for you growing up with undiagnosed Asperger's and also having a sibling? 
Well, growing up with me with undiagnosed Asperger's was all I knew, right? I mean, I never knew growing up with it or without it to compare. I knew that I struggled and I couldn't make friends. And I knew I was different from other kids. I could see that. Um, but it was, as I said, the only life I knew, and that's what I did. Um, as far as having a uh, sibling, what that was like, it's like having a sibling. I mean, do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I was wondering if you um, used him as a, as a comparison, or did he influence you? Did you have a connection with him as a, as a non-Aspergian? See, those kinds of questions would imply a knowledge of me having Asperger's. And remember that I didn't know. I knew I was different, but how did I know my brother wasn't different like me? I mean, you, when, you're, when you're 12 years old, you know, your thinking isn't really that deep about that. Um, I, I had no real way of knowing. I assumed my brother, my, me, and my parents were the same. I assumed that people didn't like me because I was in some way defective. That's kind of what all children go through when they have those kinds of issues. Um, it never occurred to me to like compare me, my little brother, and some other kid analytically. You know, I would always, I would always like look at the captain of the swim team and say, well, why do girls like him and girls don't like me? Or why would the teacher like this kid and not like me? You know, I, I always did that, but I never found the answers. So, yes. You mentioned earlier that you know, to, in today's school, if you went down to Newton, you'd see a kid in a classroom whose behavior is being excused um, because he has Asperger's, and you say, you know, medication may not always be um, a safe or a proper alternative. What would you say is the way to treat students who have not only Asperger's but perhaps other um, learning disabilities or other developmental differences? The I think the way to deal with a lot of that is for kids to learn how to behave with other kids. I talk in my book about how I couldn't make friends and I was lonely and I struggled. That's one problem that, you know, many of us have. But there's something else that's missing from my book. You will see when you read it, I do not talk about getting into fights. I don't talk about beating people up. I don't talk about getting people up getting beat up. The reason for that is that even if I didn't know how to make friends, I learned right from the earliest, you know, from three years old, how to basically take turns and cooperate peacefully in the playground with other children. And that's something that I think is missing with a lot of kids, especially kids with neurological differences, because the parents pick the kids up at school, take the kids home, put them in front of a game, put them in front of a TV, they take them places, and it's always mom and kid. It's never a kid in a pack with 10 other kids on a playground anymore. So that kind of group or pack play has, to a large extent, vanished in many towns. And kids don't learn how to take turns anymore. A kid who learned how to share the sandbox at age 3 would never get up at age 10 and throw the chair across the room because they knew at age 3 when they did that kind of stuff they got into a fight and they stopped doing it by the time they were 10. I don't think medicine is required to address those problems. Um, I, I just, you know what I would say to you, to anyone who asks the question as you did, if you don't think medicine will cure it, what will? I would say to you, go out and ask people who are 50 and 60 years old what it was like in high school. Say to them, how many kids do this, did this kind of stuff when you were in school? Almost none. Because we learned not to do it. And I, you know, I think that Learning how, to, learning how to coexist peacefully in groups is a tremendously important social skill that's very different from learning how to make friends. Um, and we don't teach that to kids a lot of the time today. And I think that is one of the greatest shortcomings in our kid raising system today in this country. So that would be the one thing I would suggest to you. Well, there's like... Those of you who like are raising your hands, I don't get to you too. I'm going to like hang around outside here afterwards too because at some point they're going to like pull the plug and throw me out of here. But I will be out there. So, yes. I just wanted to ask, it's, um, you had said that um, 
you read the book by Tony Atwood um, later on when you were older. I read it when I learned. That's how I learned about Asperger's, Asperger's. right. Um, what age would you recommend kids read it? I have a 13-year-old. And, you know, it's profound what you said that you found that it really made you feel like you weren't alone in the symptoms that you had or what the characteristics that you had. Um, would it be appropriate? I think it would be appropriate, but I would suggest if you were going to introduce somebody to Asperger's, introduce them with a book like, you know, like mine first. The reason I suggest that is that for a young person, Asperger's is only negative. Because, you know, you notice a condition like Asperger's when you notice what your kid can't do. And, and it is entirely, it is a disability in, in your eyes, you know, as a parent or as a kid at an early age. So when you give a kid a book about a disability, it's not a whole lot better than being given a book that's like understanding gonorrhea, you know? I mean, you really, you know, you don't really want to be seen with that in school, you know? And um, so the thing is, there is this sort of element of uh, shame and discomfort to it. Um, I think that Look Me in the Eye is probably one of the first books that is really a celebration of what it's like to be, you know, a person with Asperger's. There is no apology in my book, and there is no backing down, and you will not feel bad about being an Aspergian reading that story. I will guarantee it. You know, there are sad parts of it, and there are stupid parts of it and all, but on balance, you won't feel bad about it afterwards. And I think that somebody young needs to get a positive and empowering message, and that's not necessarily going to come from a clinical book like Dr. Atwood's. Now, I think for you, it's a great thing. You know, you're obviously you're old enough to read it and study it and say, yes, I, you know, because you're, you're like the age was when I, when, I, when I learned about it. So for you, yes, it's great. But I think for a young person, a book like mine is going to probably make them feel a lot better about themselves. No one, I'll, I do. You? Okay. I was actually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome two years ago, and, I, and, I, and I've been having this, this big difficulty making friends since, since elementary school, and I also don't have a girlfriend either. And, and another serious thing is, I feel like my Asperger's syndrome, my social and communication skills, prevented me from getting jobs that I'm interested, that I'm very interested in, like for the past several summers. I mean, is there any way, is there anything I can do to, to, to is there anything I can do to resolve these two problems? Like, for instance, what can I do to attract myself to more people, even though I can socialize at the villages to socialize with people a little bit? Well, one of the answers is that you're here in a school getting educated, and you're going to go out in the working world, and you are just at the age where you're making the transition from people laughing about the battery fixation to being a genius that makes Priuses go 100 miles. Um, I think that as soon as you begin to go out in the world and achieve commercial success and recognition in what you do, it's very likely that Asperger's is going to take you into engineering or science or some or mathematics or you know whatever it is that you're interested in. I'm not a geek at all. But you, <laughs> okay, but you must have. When you say, I'm not a geek, you must have, with this imbalance in your brain, you must have a particular strength. And what's vital for you is to figure out what that is. Maybe your strength is not in computers. Maybe your strength is insight into plants or insight into animals. I like to help people. Well, helping people is, you know, I mean, you, I actually am going to write about how people with, some people with Asperger's go into mental health, into therapy and so forth, and how... Some people with Asperger's have gone into work as, you know, EMTs. Um, some people have turned out to be brilliant psychiatrists. So once you find the direction you're going to go and you begin to get recognition for that, I think a lot of the misfit and friend problem is going to solve itself by your doing that. I think you're going to feel better about yourself. Um, and... Um, the, um, and another thing I would say to you, you're not part of the AANE, are you? I visited there once. I was like back in 2007. 
Well, I can't help but be struck by the fact that um, when you asked me this question about making friends, there were these people at the um, AANE relationships and dating thing that I was at a month and a half ago, and they were like going all up and down me with, why aren't there more black people to date with Asperger's in Boston? Where can I find that? Well, there's like nobody there. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and I realized that we don't, um, I, I wish you would come to some of these AANE meetings. And um, I, was kind of, I was kind of very busy with school. This is my junior year. I'm taking a bunch of tough courses. And those were, I had another difficult time trying to balance my leisure time with school. I know I should be. While I, while I sympathize with that, I know when I was your age, the thing I wanted most in the world was to have friends and have people like me. I always said I would throw away, you know, my. Everyone says I was a genius at electronics. So I would give that away to just be popular, you know. And, and I think that for those of us, you know, with this particular difference, AANE is a wonderful thing. And I would really encourage you to come to some, some of the meetings and talk to other people about overcoming that kind of stuff. Anyone who's smart enough to be in this school and all, I mean, you got the tools to do this. And I just would encourage you to come. Yeah, I'll take the one more from you back there. Hi, this is a little bit of a complicated question. But, um, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, when I was in high school, I, I co founded one of the major um, Asperger sites, uh, the now run of And one of the things that um, my co founder and I always had trouble with. Um, when we were talking to, to the press or and you know people interviewing us um, was trying to um, distill what Asperger's is down in a way that captures all all of the, the nuances that, that people really ought to know about because it, it's kind of an awkward thing you have to frame it as okay it's a it's a real disability it's got a DSM four definition um, then you kind of have to strip that away and be like okay so it's not just a di disability blah blah blah. Um, and, and a lot of that always gets lost in, in translation, um, uh, especially with Fox News. I'd be careful about that. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, so in, in your dealings with, with people and trying to explain Asperger's and, and trying to um, communicate, um, how, how, best, how, can you, how can you do this when you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of uh, attention span from the other person? Well, I, I tried to do that, explaining the imbalance of intelligence and the emotional weakness. Did you feel that conveyed it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean quickly, when you have, when you have a, a ten minute interview and you have, I guess I, guess I didn't phrase my question. I, you know, I think or, that... Or, or especially with, um, I mean, I've even had this trouble with, with people I know um, in my own life, because um, sometimes you take a huge risk just, just mentioning you have anything at all. Well, I, I describe it, like I say, as an imbalance of intelligence with a strong logical brain and a weak emotional brain. And I say that I'm blind to a lot of social cues that are obvious to everyone else. And, and yet, that's complemented by being really smart logically. It's just that I may come to very different conclusions than you or anyone else because I don't see the nonverbal cues. So that, to me, is the sort of the quickest explanation. but. Remember also, since I, you know, write books about this, um, people may come to me with more pre-existing insight or whatever. They may see it differently. I should thank you all for coming to see me and uh, thank the library for having me out here and putting this on and providing food and drink and stuff. And